Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. Now to your host, Ken Jakes. Hi, everyone. This is Ken Jakes. I'm the host of Democracy That Delivers, our podcast here at SITE. And I'm joined with a couple of friends of the organization, uh, direct from Nepal. I'm going to introduce them both. The first one is Bikin Gamira. He is a communications and product manager at the Accountability Lab. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you, Ken. How are you? Yeah, really glad to have you on the program. And your colleague, Sylvester Shapagain, she is a project associate and works with you directly in Nepal. How are you? I'm good. How are you? And thanks for having us. Oh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We work with the Accountability Lab in a lot of different countries uh, here at SITE. And what I'd like to do is kind of reintroduce uh, Accountability Lab to our listeners. And uh, why don't we start, either one of you can kind of jump in and explain what the Accountability Lab is and, and what you do specifically, and then your relationship with, with my organization. Yep. Um, Accountability Lab is a global, actually, we're globally present, and it's a global translocal network of like-minded people that works towards making governance work for people everywhere. So how we do that is by supporting active citizens, responsible leaders, and accountable institutions. So my role in that is, besides communications, which is helpful everywhere, I just support the whole team to design new programs and come up with ideas where we can solve societal issues in different communities across Nepal. So, Desha, what do you do there? Well, I work as a project associate, as you mentioned earlier. So I basically work closely with the field staff. Uh, basically, we have like a field staff across seven provinces in Nepal who go to the communities and who, uh, you know, work with local people there. So I just sort of stay in direct communication with them and assist them if they need any help from the core team. Yeah, so that's what I do. So what we're going to talk about today is the, uh, the, the COVID crisis, the pandemic. I had a couple of people on from Nepal about a year and a half ago, just when the crisis was starting. So a lot has happened since then. It's been about 18 months or so. Uh, We're going to talk, the title of today's program really is Citizen-Centric Development and Response During the Pandemic in Nepal. Where did the government fail? Mm -hmm. Which I think is a very interesting title. Uh, First of all, what is citizen-centric development? Well, the definition is in the word itself. Citizen-centric means just keeping the citizens at the center of development-making decisions, policy-making decisions, and not to leave them in the periphery. Basically, we have, well, the government needs to include citizens during, from the initial phase, basically, and then keep getting the responses, the feedback, and then create programs and designs for development. Let's kind of walk through the pandemic. And I've interviewed a lot of people from a lot of different countries. And, it's, you know, every country is different. Cultures are different. Economic uh, situation is different. But there's a lot of things that are very, very similar. In most developing countries where we work, there's economic problems to begin with. You know, mm-hmm. high unemployment. There's um, the... The informal sector is very, very large, a lot of corruption. Yeah. So there's a lot of the same patterns we mm-hmm. see all over the world. When you put the pandemic, when you put COVID on top of it, that just exacerbates the problem. Yeah. It, it makes things much worse. Here in the United States, we we're fortunate enough, in a lot of Western countries, we had a, a, an economic safety net that we could rely on. You know, we had uh, a lot of pieces of legislation that really help the economy. There was a lot of loans made. There was a lot of businesses that were helped economically. Nepal and other countries like Nepal, they don't have that option. Yeah. They just don't have the resources to do that. So, and, the, and then on the, on the healthcare side, there's a lot of different problems that developing countries face as well. So kind of walk us through, first of all, before we get to where we are today, on how that all has developed in the last 18 months. It's been really downhill for Nepal, actually, since the COVID started almost two years ago now. COVID didn't really hit Nepal really hard in the first phase. And the first wave wasn't even really that impactful in Nepal. It stopped a lot of the economy in Nepal. And the growth rate GDP dropped from 7% to like 3% average for 2020 in Nepal as well. But what happened was that during the pandemic, rather than the health crisis, it was more of an economic and livelihood crisis in Nepal. A lot of businesses shut down because they couldn't really provide for themselves. They couldn't really even afford to pay taxes, actually, at the end of different restrictions that was included in Nepal. So the condition of Nepal after and presently as well is 
economically, basically, really, really poor. And the government actually needs to focus a lot on economic growth going forward as well, I think. Yeah, like adding up to what Begin said, like 2020 was, you know, said to be the, you know, visit Nepal 2020 year. So it was the year where we were sort of planning to thrive in terms of tourism. And a lot of, you know, um, tourism sector like hotels and, you know, hospitality industry was really expanding. A lot of host- hotels were building. So uh, when the pandemic started um, since uh, January itself, you know, everything was sort of like all these hotels that were, you know, building on loans where uh, they were very confused as to how they should move forward. And um, we really saw the crisis there itself. Uh, the, you know, the crisis really uh, brought forward the ill preparedness of government. Still, this um, hotels that have actually sta- established or that were really planning to establish that had taken loans from banks, uh, they still are very in, in a very confused situation. And the next thing is that uh, Nepal is a country which is heavily relied on remittance. So um, a lot of large mass of uh, you know Nepali youths, they are they used to stay in uh, they stay stay in Gulf countries and they work there and send money home. So uh, when the you know pandemic started uh, and you know the whole world came into standstill, a lot of these youths that were working outside and sending money home, they were not being able to do that because they lost their employment there. And um, most of like a lot of people also returned back um, to Nepal and uh, there was this huge situation of of unemployment in Nepal itself. So still now the government is struggling. The people are struggling. Um, Unemployment has risen a lot. And uh, similarly, a lot of like other economic sectors have also been, um, you know, seeing um, a downflow. So yeah, government needs to really thoroughly plan on all of this. Well, let's talk about the government for a little bit. I mean, that, that's uh, central to, do, I think, what we want to talk about. Where did the government fail? What what was their, let's step back just a little bit. What was their initial response? And then what type of follow-up did they have? And also a third part of that question is what about international help? What have you seen since then? But let's start with the government first. Uh, we've been talking about this a lot in Accountability Lab as well. The problem with government's response is that they have always been reactive rather than proactive in Nepal. They've just waited for a problem to happen and then try to find a solution to that problem rather than just find a solution before the problem happens. Because this is not the first time that Nepal was hit with a crisis because Nepal went through a really big earthquake in 2015 and immediately after that there was the border crisis as well. And on reports the government wrote, okay, these were the problems, these are the learnings, we need to prepare better for future pandemics or crises. And then after when the coronavirus pandemic hit, everything was in sandals because the government was not prepared for this. The healthcare sector failed really, really badly in Nepal. That was the, the primary thing that everyone noticed is that the healthcare system was not ready for this because there were a lot of people coming back from India, from Gulf countries who were working abroad and then they were scared for the lives so they wanted to return back to Nepal but the healthcare system wasn't even prepared to take all of these people who may or may not have been infected by COVID to keep them in quarantine. So that was the first response that the government's response was reactive after that. So after that they started constructing new areas for quarantine but there were already a lot of people that needed place to sit for that. And besides that, uh, the other issue was that lockdown was, well, one of the good things as well. Lockdown was issued in Nepal quite early because there were only like 10 to 15 cases at that point in Nepal. So that was a really good decision by the government. But, well, the cases weren't rising a lot, but when this uplifted that lockdown like two to three months later, they didn't have a plan to do that. They just said, okay, Nepal is good now. We can uplift the lockdown. And as soon as that happened, the cases started to rise really, really, in a really fast rate. Right. And, and you've gone through different phases of the pandemic. And more recently, I mean, what we see here in the United States is the, the massive amount of COVID cases in India, which has a direct impact on on your country as well, I'm sure. And that's probably what you're going through right now, right? Yeah, definitely. India, I mean, we can't really put the blame on India, basically, because... No, of course not. Well, you're just, you're close to them. Uh, Yeah. That's the only blame that you could... Yeah. Well, there's two things. We're really close to India and our borders are open. So basically people can just go to India or come to Nepal anytime they want it. So that was actually a really big reason for the cases, the number of cases to rise in the first wave and in the second wave recently as well. 
Yeah. And we talked before the program about vaccinations. And you said that early on, there was about 200,000 doses. And just yesterday, you received another 300,000, which in this uh, country, the size of Nepal, that's not very many, is it? No, it's not a lot. And well, earlier, we got a little bit more than 200,000. We got about 200, 100,000 from India in the first phase, and then 100,000 more. But we got a little bit like 50,000, 60,000 from different countries. But and recently, it's actually today, we got 300,000. That's the latest news for vaccines. And it's not a lot at all. There's only like around 2% of the whole population who have been vaccinated both times. And like 7 to 8% have been vaccinated once. Yeah, and that's not very much at all. Is it a one-dose system or a two-dose system? It's a two-dose system for Nepal. It is. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about technology. That, that has been a big topic of this program as it uh, pertains to the crisis. One thing that we have found is that in many countries, in, in fact, every country that I've talked to people in, technology has a very positive impact on the economy because of COVID. We're doing this uh, podcast right now because of technology that I never would have used if it wasn't for the pandemic. And unfortunately for me, we probably wouldn't have you both of you on my program because in the past we would just come in my office, we would set up the studio there. And unless you were in Washington, you wouldn't be on the program. Now we can do this any place in the world if you have an internet connection. And it's because of the pandemic, it really is. And what we have found is that many, many businesses pivoted and pivoted wisely when the pandemic began and they started using technology. And in a lot of cases, businesses really were more profitable after the pandemic than it was before because of it. Do you see some of that kind of stuff going on in Nepal as well? Yeah. So I'd like to answer a few things. I mean, yes, sure, uh, absolutely. Of course, a lot of businesses actually started uh, working virtually. So um, like it was a like positive change that was seen. And also for COVID response, we saw a lot of, you know, youths uh, really leveraging this, uh, you know, virtual platforms to sort of connect uh, the service seeker and service receivers. Like uh, we also like interviewed uh, uh, one of the youth who was act who opened a you know sort of a website where he was connecting uh, the service seekers like who needs oxygen or who needs ventilator who needs hospital beds with the hospitals and other service providers. So uh, we could see that the youth had been using. Uh, a lot of these virtual platforms and uh, which are really uh, which are easy to use and which are really cheap as well so for them to like uh, it's, it's easier to use the virtual platform than to establish a whole you know like uh, physical sort of uh, organization so that was seen and also uh, yeah i mean nepal in a lot of things in nepal would be done in paper like we're really like obsessed with our work and all so right. even offices even government offices started using a lot of you know virtual online platforms uh, even recently even for vaccination the government uh, the ministry uh, recently brought this uh, prepared the online form where we could go and uh, you know register ourselves and then the ministry would invite us when our turn will come for the vaccines so that positive uh, aspect was definitely seen, but also there was a lot of uh, digital divide because uh, like Nepal, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, Nepal, I think is like we have like an urban city areas where people use a lot of uh, you know uh, online platforms and virtual platform. Internet is very accessible, but then there are also places which is very which is deprived from internet and technology. So especially in terms of education, in terms of schooling, it was very problematic and. Um, it has uh, actually propagated inequalities in um, societies as well. Like uh, there are people, there are communities that are leveraging online platforms, virtual platforms and uh, being efficient and, you know, continuing their work as it is. And then there are um, the other, uh, you know, communities that are being internet deprived and their, you know, progress and their advancement has completely stopped. Uh, what's the government's response to been uh, ha have been to technology? Uh, has it been positive? Are they like in most governments behind the curve? And uh, private sector is always out in front on this. So, so what has their response been? The government actually has been promoting technology, uh, use of technology, basically. At this time, they've digitized a lot of their services, but it's still quite not enough because Nepal has, was really, really behind on the curve. As Subhaksha mentioned earlier, everything was paper-based in Nepal, it used to be paper-based in Nepal, and it still is a lot of services. You still need to visit government offices and then physically get a lot of your services through the governments as well. But they have been promoting a lot of digital digitization right now with their services, like 
registering for COVID and registering your company names as well. Because registering your names, all of this used to be physical in Nepal and they've been promoting digitization as well. But there's still a lot of gap between them and the private sector basically right now because the private sector is way ahead. They've been doing all of their marketing, all of their services, everything has been online and on digital platforms and government is way behind. And when there needs to be a collaboration between these two parties, there is a clear gap. Uh, has there been a lot of investment by uh, digital providers outside of the big cities or is that still kind of lagging behind? It's still lagging quite a bit. There are a few companies that focus just on rural areas, not on urban, not in cities, but they go to villages, hilly areas mostly, and they just provide their services there. But the big companies, the ones with good internet and one with better online services are limited to cities mostly. But the telecommunication companies are doing better though, because they have a lot of towers built in all over Nepal, basically, and their internet has been improving. So let's talk about the sectors that were hit. You, you, you talked about the, uh, the uh, tourism sector, which is huge. And that's something that, that everybody knows about because of mountain climbing and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful country. And you also have competition from the Chinese, correct? In, yeah. in tourism mm-hmm. on, the, on the other side of the mountain. So how, how has that been going? Tourism has been, I mean, it's probably the most hit sector right now due to the pandemic because we used to see a lot of tourists well, for mountain, not just for mountain climbing, just for sightseeing and a lot of different reasons just for vacation as as well. And right now, I think in the two years, almost two years, one and a half years, we have really seen many tourists in Nepal. And it's not just the, not just for mountain climbing that has been hit. And a lot of hotels have run out, run out of business. There used to be so many hotels just from my home to work and from in my commute. And right now, I see like three to four of them closed down already. Yeah, and yeah, adding to that, a lot of. Um people you know would work in this um, industry you know would work in hotels and would work in other hospitality um, you know provide service providers have also lost their jobs so yeah that has also brought about you know right. another problem um, in Nepali society. What other sectors have been really hit hard by the pandemic? One of the other ones that I've personally seen are surprisingly digital marketing agencies. And if you really? yep, and if you dig deep enough, it's not really that surprising because I have a lot of my friends who have their own digital marketing companies, and business is really low for them. Like if you look at the surface, it should be like okay, people can't go out in digital marketing or anything digital should be thriving, but. A lot of businesses can't open right now. There are clothing stores, jewelry stores, technology stores, anything that sells products, they can't open right now. They can't really sell anything. So these agencies that market these products can't really find any business for themselves. Yeah. And the next is, I think the education sector has also been, uh, you know, hard hit by the pandemic because schools are closed, colleges are closed. The, you know, the education institution cannot uh, afford to, you know, put their lives of, of their students at risk. And uh, even as, as I mentioned earlier, even for schools and colleges to con- conduct online, you know, exams or efficiently conduct online exams and classes, there's a huge digital divide. There are places where, you know, internet is available and very accessible. And then there are places where, uh, you know, internet, it's, it's very internet deprived. So uh, to conduct uh, exams, to conduct, you know, classes also, the institutions has to take things into consideration because, well, in Kathmandu, if you see like the local in Kathmandu are very rare. I mean, people migrate from all across the country in Kathmandu. And after the pandemic, a lot of people have actually gone to their respective, you know, respective homes or the, their permanent homes in villages and in, in ruler parts. So uh, even the colleges that are in Kathmandu are also seeing that problem because most of the students are from villages, from rural areas. So that is one of the reasons. And also for the sustainability of the UNA institution is also at risk because uh, the colleges, the schools, they take buildings, they take like take infrastructures on rent. So it is becoming very problematic for them to, you know, pay rents of the buildings that they have also. You know, that's a good point. And, and I haven't thought about it in terms of this program. But education all over the world has been hit very hard, even here in the United States. There's a lot of areas of the country that aren't wealthy. And in the United States, education is funded at the state and local level uh, by and large. Uh, Where my kids go to school, it's in Arlington County, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. It's a very wealthy county. And all the kids got computers. They got iPads. 
And if you go to other parts of the country, they just simply can't afford it. And I'm assuming that, that, that Nepal is probably very similar in, in a lot of ways. Yep, absolutely. So when, you, when you're locked down in the pandemic, you can't get into a classroom. The students really, really will be hit hard by that. That's and true. I'm sure you've seen the exact same thing. Yep, that's really true. And well, that's a bigger problem in private schools mostly because it was the private schools who enforced like, online classes during right. the start. And well, technically speaking, a lot of students who went to private schools could afford a internet and a device, a mobile device or a laptop. So they were still going to classes, but the students who were studying in public schools, they were the ones who hit, were hit the most. And the problem with the government's response in Nepal is that they didn't really have a solution. They promoted online learning, but they didn't really do it for themselves in public schools. And for the past two years now, uh, students who were supposed to graduate through grade 10 with a really difficult exam. That's what they, we all said in Nepal, the grade 10 examination is really difficult. They just passed without even giving and uh, even taking an examination for two years. Yeah, and uh, what I was trying to add is that the, you know, the problem that we see in in education sector, it's not like, it, it's really, um, it is it is very long-term problem, you know, because the students were not be able right. to go to schools now, they will see the repercussions of this uh, in their young years as well, you know, as they grow up, the, you know, this is not like an immediate uh, problem or the consequences are not just immediate, but it will be very long term. And, uh, you know, it can even affect the economy of the country, you know, 10 years down the line as well of what the problem right. we are seeing today. That's true. Now, do, do you both see an increase in people living in your country trying to flee the country to find better economic solutions because of COVID? Has, has, has that problem got worse? Well, that has always been a problem, kind of, in Nepal. <laughs> but um, not not presently, no. Personally, I haven't seen a lot of people that have said they, wanted, they want to move abroad for better economic opportunities. It's also probably a reason because of the circle I'm in and people are, want to do something. They, all of them just say, right. I want to do something in Nepal. I want to improve the condition of Nepal. That could be a reason, but in social, on social medias or just areas where we work as well, I haven't seen a lot of change in people yet. People wanted to go abroad for work. They wanted to still want to go abroad for work, but I haven't seen her. COVID-19 as a reason to go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, it has been very right. different, actually, because uh, the people that I talk to, you know, uh, more than the COVID pandemic, I think the government response to COVID pandemic at the moment, that is something that um, people are perceiving uh, in, a, in a negative way, because there's a lot of political instability going on, a lot of political drama going on in the country. And I think that is something that the youths are very disappointed about. And that is something that is encouraging uh, youth to sort of, you know, uh, flee the country because a pandemic is everywhere. But the, you know, the reluctance uh, to be proactive or the reluctance to, you know, work uh, like for the COVID response is something that is being seen in Nepal at the moment. So I think that is really uh, disappointing among the youths. Well, we got about four minutes left. And at the end of each program, I like to ask uh, whether or not you're optimistic or pessimistic. So if you're going to look five years down the road, what, what, what do you see in Paul? I can start on this one because, sure. well, I've been long, working longer in accountability lab and there's just something that just sticks on you when you start working on with accountability lab. It's that we always focus on positive rather than the negative. And yes, the, the situation is not really good in Nepal, but there are a lot of people and a lot that we can say who want to change right now. A lot of youths have been going on the streets, voicing their concerns on social media. A lot of youths have been taking initiatives to change the current situation in Nepal. If the government can provide solutions, then we are going to do it ourselves. There have been a lot of changes in the mentality of people to improve the condition of the country. Because we've been, I mean, for 20 years, Nepal has been through hell, basically hell, right? right? There was no political stability. There was no constitution in the country. It was just really bad in Nepal, and people have said enough is enough, we need to change this. And I think five years from now, well, the situation is not going to completely improve in five years, but I do see a really good positive change when these youths actually develop into uh, leadership positions in the future, and they are going to make really good changes in the country. Sebastian, what about you? Yeah. 
uh, I'd also like to be hopeful. Uh, what I think is that the you know COVID pandemic has shown a lot of weaknesses uh, in Nepal's governance and um, in other sectors. So as I mentioned earlier, with COVID, I think we have also seen a lot of like a lot of opportunities have also come up with the crisis. A lot of people would initially like go to Gulf countries and then work there. Now, a lot of these youths have actually migrated back to the country and everybody likes staying with their family and working here. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a time that Nepal can actually work from scratch. And um, if the government really plans in a proactive way, then uh, we can actually retain these youths in uh, Nepal, these youths who would actually go to, you know, Gulf countries and work there or other, you know, other countries. So, yeah, that way there's a lot of opportunities in Nepal for government in, to work in terms of uplifting the employment and uplifting other sectors as well. As uh, we talked earlier about education and the digital divide, uh, COVID has shown that there's a digital divide. There is inequality in education. Now, this can be a right time for government to actually think about it and plan as to how we can you know, narrow these inequalities. Yeah, so I'm I'm very hopeful. Well, thanks so much. We're we're out of time, unfortunately. It went by very quickly. I learned a lot. As I said, I interviewed a couple of people right when the pandemic has started. So it's very uh, good to, to get an update. I know our listeners uh, will enjoy this program as well. But uh, Vicky and Sebeka, thanks so much for being on the program. I hope we have you back. And uh, your organization does a lot of really good work. And uh, it's a nice partnership we have with my organization and yours. So uh, thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Good luck in, in, and stay safe. I know you're still in the middle of the pandemic, so just, just be safe out there. You too. So uh, thanks again, and we'll see everybody next time. Take care. Democracy That Delivers has been brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. For more information, please visit sipe.org.